This is uh, Dr. Sherman Silver, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, the Infertility Center of St. Louis, and I'm here on Facebook Live to answer all of your questions, any, anything that comes to mind about your infertility or your fertility. So I'm here and ready. Okay. Our first question is, how long should I be trying to have a baby before I seek infertility treatment? So the question every couple asks is that question. How long should we be trying to have a baby just with natural, unprotected intercourse before we go to an infertility doctor or try to seek help or treatment? And the usual standard answer for that is one year. In other words, the chance of being pregnant in one year is so high if you're fertile that if it's gone more than a year, then it's time to get treatment. Now, it's a little different if you're 42 or 43, if you're older. The time to get help then is, is right away because, uh, you know, for a 25-year-old, you have such a low risk of infertility, it's about 10%. But if you're 42 years old, you actually got a 90% risk of being infertile. So you shouldn't waste time because the more time you waste, the harder it will be to get pregnant even with treatment. So we love to treat people that are in the older age group uh, that have problems because their eggs are older, uh, but it's so much easier uh, if you're younger. Debbie would like to know, would you recommend artificial insemination before going to IVF? Well, the classical thing is do we recommend IUI or artificial insemination, like with your husband's sperm, uh, before going to IVF? That is a very controversial question. So I'm just going to give you my view, which is probably different from what you are going to hear from uh, the standard, perhaps conventional infertility doctor. Uh, I have been doing this for over 40 years, almost 50 years, long before IVF. And the early days of IUI, it was just an effort for people that had no idea how to do IVF to think they were doing something high tech, like washing sperm and inseminating it. But the truth is all of our data showed that timed intercourse was really better than IUI. IUI is just a way for the doctor to charge you money, for the insurance companies to have some protocol, which is a stupid protocol, and uh, for you to waste a lot of body and a lot of time. So you could be doing IUIs, six IUIs over the next 12 or 16 months while your eggs are getting older, and it's a waste of time because intercourse would work really just as well. And you know, intercourse and stimulation with ovulatory drugs, which it goes along with IUI, intercourse is really a much better way of depositing the sperm than IUI. IUI is really stupid. But it was originally brought up at it was University of Southern California before anybody could do IVF really well in the United States in 1982. You wash the sperm, you use an infant feeding tube. Most of the young doctors don't even know the history of this and you put it in the uterus and you think you're doing something technological that's better than intercourse, but the data shows it is not better. So if you need treatment and you're not getting pregnant on your own, then it's better to go right to IVF. And in the long run, going right to IVF is going to be less expensive because the pregnancy rate for IVF should be at least 50% per transfer, 60 or 70% in good hands with younger women. But the pregnancy rate for RUI is not going to be any more than 8%. And, uh, and that's with stimulation with ovulatory drugs. So, so, so this isn't the conventional answer, but it's the correct answer. Don't waste your time with IUI. It's very frustrating and emotionally painful and very unrewarding. So that's my view about it, if you should do intrauterine insemination first. Rachel would like to know what supplements can a woman or man take to help increase their success of conceiving? Oh, this is really interesting, uh, Rachel. Your, your question is something that comes up with every couple that I see. Everybody wants to know what supplement they can take that will improve their fertility. And, you know, that's a $15 billion a year industry, and, and really it's all fraudulent. It's really completely fraudulent. Uh, in fact, it's risky to take supplements because the FDA has no regulatory control 
over supplements. Like drugs and food, they have regulatory control over, but not over supplements. It's a stupid law that was passed in 1996, and I'm sure it was a response to some lobbying groups that wanted to create this 15 or $16 billion a year industry, and it's a fraudulent industry. The problem is they're going to put possibly some active ingredients in these natural supplements, maybe a phenylephrine or maybe some kind of an epinephrine-like drug that'll get you feeling better and more energetic, uh, maybe testosterone that'll definitely give you greater sexual drive and make you feel something is happening reproductively, or maybe just estrogen, the so-called kind hormone that might help your skin and, uh, and, and you might feel that it's a natural estrogen, not a uh, synthetic one, so it's good for you. All that is not true. All that will interfere with your fertility rather than help your fertility. So again, this is counterculture. The culture says I should be able to take some supplements uh, that will help me help my fertility. Because for thirty nine ninety five, what have I got to lose if I buy some supplements? And uh, it's it's very uh, subtle. It's a subtle sell, but it's actually not only unhelpful, but it can really be dangerous and it can hurt your fertility. For men, the same thing is true. So many of these male supplements have testosterone or androgenic substances in them. In fact, many uh, primary care doctors will put the man on testosterone, you know, androgel, putting it on the skin and uh, thinking that, and the guy will even think that's helping because it's improving his sex drive, his energy level. But actually all it's doing is reducing his sperm count by suppressing his pituitary glands production of FSH. We see that all the time. Men placed on testosterone, which actually hurts their fertility. Women taking these dietary supplements, many dietary supplements, with all kinds of exotic names. And uh, all that does is hurt the fertility rather than help the fertility. It's a waste of your time and money. Dr. Silver, what is the best indicator of a woman's fertility? What's the best indicator of a woman's fertility is, is a very good question. So uh, the most important indicator really is a question that came up earlier, and that is the number of years or the number of months of having intercourse without contraception without getting pregnant. Now, even a man with a low sperm count can impregnate a very, very fertile wife. It's quite amazing. Now, if she has fertility problems herself or if she's older, then the low sperm count interferes. But it's amazing how teenagers, even with a partner that has extremely low sperm count, gets pregnant easily. And there's like a 0.2% risk of a teenager being infertile, ironically. And in your early 20s, it's, uh, there's a 2% chance of being infertile. So it's a tenfold decline in fertility from your teen years to your early 20s. And then by the time you're in your early 30s, it's 20% risk of in being infertile. And so the man's sperm count becomes a problem only when the woman's eggs are older. But now the question is, what's her best indication of fertility? Well, okay, you can test your ovulation. The ovulation kits that you buy at the drugstores can be extremely inaccurate. So it gives you some idea whether you're ovulating in mid-cycle or not, but it can be misleading. The most important indicator is regular 28-day cycles. Now certainly women are fertile that have 29 or 30-day cycles or some variability in their cycles. But extremely irregular cycles, extremely irregular cycles are usually a sign you're not ovulating. And that's an indication of infertility. <coughs> now, um, other than that, there are a lot of tests that are performed to see whether or not a woman is infertile. I mean, there's a lot of different tests you can have. The doctor may suggest laparoscopy, or uh, that's looking inside your abdomen with a telescope, or hysterosalpingogram to see what the contour of your uterus looks on x-ray. Uh, there are all kinds of hormone tests that they're going to get, whether it's the FSH level, day three hormones, or AMH. You'll hear all of this. Frankly, none of this 
is as valuable as a properly done ultrasound evaluating your uterus in three dimensions and counting your antral follicles. That tells us what your egg reserve is, how many eggs you have, and whether your uterus is normal, and even tells us whether you have dilated fallopian tubes from blockage that can interfere with getting pregnant. So a simple but properly done ultrasound and your menstrual history are the two most important and least expensive indicators of your fertility. So many of the other expensive hormonal tests insurance companies may pay for, laparoscopies, hysterosalpingograms, uh, complicated uh, uh, sperm analysis like uh, DNA sperm fragmentation, don't really, don't really help. Uh, I'm sure you're going to wind up getting them ordered. But the most important thing, at least for the woman, is carefully done ultrasound with antrophological count for ovarian reserve, three-dimensional evaluation for the uterus, and aside from the ultrasound, simply an accurate menstrual history. For the male, uh, a simple sperm count. I've, I've written a whole chapter in textbooks on this, that a simple sperm count is just as valuable, or more valuable, than any of the complicated sperm evaluation tests that your doctors might make a lot of money on by doing it in their lab. Just a simple sperm count. So that's really uh, maybe a long answer, but a, but a good answer to how a woman could know whether she's fertile or how fertile she is. Julie would like to know, is AMH or FSH helpful in determining fertility? Okay, so the question is, what about AMH and FSH? Or these are hormone tests that are often performed, and are they, are they helpful in determining your fertility? Well, AMH stands for anti-malarian hormone, and FSH stands for follicle-stimulating hormone. The AMH uh, level is uh, an indication from your ovary, really, of how many antral follicles you have. It's a very indirect indication of it. And uh, if the AMH is high, that means you've got a lot of eggs. If the AMH is low, you don't have many eggs. AMH is very popular because it's a simple lab test. Uh, but frankly, we found that if the ultrasonographer knows what they're doing, then the antral follicle count is a better uh, evaluation of your ovarian reserve than AMH. So AMH is sort of okay. The FSH level is really not very valuable. The FSH level goes up when your number of eggs goes down, but it remains flat as your ovarian reserve goes down over many, many years and only begins to go up when your ovarian reserve is extraordinarily low. So we always get a day three FSH. Uh, we always get LH and estradiol, estrogen levels, but frankly, you should not uh, evaluate your fertility based on the day 3 FSH. Uh, a low day 3 FSH and a low estradiol at the same time on day 3 of your cycle usually means an adequate ovarian reserve, but it's not very it's not very accurate. So an AMH is a little more accurate than that, but most accurate and not changing at any time during your menstrual cycle is the antral follicle count. That is on ultrasound looking at the small follicles, the follicles that started four months ago from your resting reserve in your ovary, over four months to reach the stage where they're sensitive to the hormones that will stimulate ovulation. Those antral follicles are proportional to your total number of eggs, and we can see it with our own two eyes, and it's more reliable than any of the hormone tests if you're going to choose one test. Carrie would like to know, do you believe that DHEA is helpful? So the question uh, Carrie brings up is, uh, is DHEA helpful? DHEA is given to so many women all around the world that are older and have a low ovarian reserve to try to get more eggs. Very, very popular. Completely a myth. Randomized control trials that were reported at the ESHRAE meeting last year in Helsinki, that's the European Society of Human Reproduction, really carefully, scientifically, quantitated, randomized control trials, 
showed that not only is DHEA of no use whatsoever, but DHEA is actually a male hormone. And that's, a male hormone isn't great for the ovary. So probably everybody out there who has a low ovarian reserve, who is 40 years or older, someone, they probably have tried DHEA. Either their doctor has told them to use DHEA or they, they've heard it from other people. It's all over the internet. But the scientific studies show DHEA, it doesn't help at all for older women or younger women in either improving their egg quality or increasing the number of eggs. It's a myth. There's so many myths out there that we have to bust, and, and DHEA is one of the biggest ones. So, no, don't use DHEA. It can be harmful, and it can't be helpful. A lot of centers recommend PGS testing. Do you recommend this for your patients? So PGS testing is a real popular movement right now. That stands for pre-implantation genetic screening. Some people call it PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But clearly, PGD means a different thing. PGD means you're a carrier of a genetic disease that could be lethal or harmful to the baby, and it's really beautiful to biopsy the embryo make the diagnosis, and only transplant embryos that don't carry that lethal or damaging genetic disease, such as cystic fibrosis or Gaucher's or Tay-Sachs, uh, or, well, there are 6,000 of them anyway. And if uh, you and your husband are carriers of both of them, then the there's a 25% chance your child would have it. Or they're what we call autosomal dominant ones, and and then you could just be a carrier, or a husband a carrier, and there's a 50% chance your child might have it. So, okay, so PGD is very valuable and useful. PGS, which is becoming very popular, is just counting chromosomes. And it's an attempt to select the embryos or embryo that is most likely to result in a baby uh, to improve the pregnancy rate for embryo transfer. Now, it does cost a lot of extra money, and the problem with PGS is, the joke that was made at the European Society last year is that PGS is great for women who don't need it, but it doesn't really help women who do need it. What do we mean by that? If you have a low number of eggs and you're older, you don't want to lose a single embryo. And yet, we know you diagnose embryos as abnormal that are really normal. And then you throw them away and you give that woman a lower pregnancy rate. It's been shown by randomized controlled trials that PGS can't possibly raise the pregnancy rate per patient. It might raise the pregnancy rate per transfer, but not per patient. So we think for older women it's a disaster. It's better to get the best quality embryos and not risk losing 5 or 10% of them that would have been a baby that you misdiagnose. Why do you misdiagnose them? Because human embryos are mosaics. You have normal cells and you have abnormal cells in terms of chromosome count. And the normal cells outgrow the abnormal ones. And we're all mosaics. So you can easily make a diagnosis of it being abnormal and throw it away, and that could be a baby. But PGS can be useful for younger women who have failed to have an implantation after many embryo transfers to try to figure out what's going on, not to raise her pregnancy rate, it won't do that, but it's to try to give her an answer. Or for women with recurrent miscarriages that are sick of it and want to know what's going on because so many miscarriages are caused by an abnormal number of chromosomes. So PGS has its use, but it's really completely abused and overused now and sort of just a, a money spinner, and for at least older women, uh, it lowers the pregnancy rate. Okay, so our next Facebook Live uh, date for answering questions is going to be at March 9th at uh, 1 p.m. So tune in March 9th at 1 p.m., and we will answer all your questions, controversial or simple. We're happy to talk with you. This is Sherman Silver signing off.